So we're going to find domain and range on our next examples. And it looks like I'm writing really, really big again. So I'll try to shrink it back up to something reasonable. Let's not look up. <laughs> See how bad the scale really is. So right away, uh, because of the section we're in, we know our domain is going to be a subset of probably two or three dimensional space, and our range is going to be one dimensional, a subset of one dimensional space. So we'll take our first function, f of xy equals square root y minus x squared. So let's go domain first. So I'll write the three rules for domain on the right side. So the original two, two rules were don't divide by zero. And uh, no even roots of negative numbers, or really no complex values. complex values that will be even roots of negatives. And we also are going to have logarithms. So if you just have log base a of x, your log input has to be greater than zero. Can't equal zero, it's got to be greater than zero. So those are the three rules that we have. They should be pretty familiar, so I'm not going to leave them on the screen. Um, especially the first two should be very familiar. Which of those three rules do we need to worry about on this problem? So we got a square root, so we got to make sure it's real, not complex. Y cannot be negative. So what we need to do is make sure the input y minus x squared is greater than or equal to zero. So that's what it means for our root to be real. So all I did was wrote the input down and made sure it's positive. How in the world do we solve this? This is not a linear inequality. So I could add x squared. Remember, adding, subtracting never flips your inequality. You better be really careful if you're going to multiply or divide. So let's think about what we're looking at. There is two possibilities. x squared is equal to y squared, or x squared is less than uh, y. That's what it means to be less than or equal to. Either less than or you're equal to. Which one of those two is easy to think about? The equality is easy. So what what can you say about this equation here? That x does not matter if it's positive or negative. It matters if it y is negative. So y can't be negative. That's one thing we can conclude. How about a parabola? This is a parabola, what you're looking at. Have you seen parabolas before? Let's go ahead and graph that thing out. So there's our y equals x squared, or x squared equals y parabola. So every point in the parabola satisfies the equation, the equality on the left. What about the inequality on the right? How is that related to the graph that I drew? So it says y needs to be greater than x squared. So what I graphed is y is x squared, which is fine, but also y can be above what I graphed. So I get the graph itself plus everything above it. So the way we're going to write that, we're just going to shade it in like this. 
And to be really complete, you probably want to put little tiny arrows to indicate it's the entire uh, upper, the, basically the interior of the parabola. So there's the domain written out, or not written out, but drawn. So that's a picture of the domain right there. We can write it out in set builder notation. Uh, if we do write in set builder notation, it really doesn't get much better than the first thing that I wrote down after domain. So if I write it in set builder, x comma y such that there's a few ways to write it. I'll go with that. Uh, I'll go with the last one, x squared less than or equal to y. You can use any of these three as your condition. They're the exact same condition. We just did a tiny bit of algebra to get from one to the next. Sometimes it's really good to have a picture of your domain. Sometimes it's really good to have a set notation, a uh, set builder notation description depending on what you're doing. So we got both right here. Let's find the range now. The range of this function is pretty easy. What type of outputs can you get out of the f function? Or maybe what type of outputs could you not get out of the f function? We can get way more than, well, we can't even get all even numbers. It's a square root function. What type of numbers can you not get out of a square root function? Negative. Negatives. So I can get all positive real numbers out of this. You can see that pretty easily. Even if x was always 0, just when x is 0, you can get any number out just using y. And if you allow x and y to be anything in our domain, you can get any number, any positive number out you want. You can't get negatives no matter what combination of x and y you use. You could theoretically get complex numbers out, but we're restricting our domain to not allow complex numbers to be uh, outputted from our function. That's why we were careful on our domain. So range will be 0 to infinity, and this is a real interval. So always expect in this section, expect your domain to be multi-dimensional, usually two or three, and your range should be one-dimensional. So that's domain and range. We're going to do two more examples. function will be the reciprocal of x times y. So you have your domain rules written down. Go ahead and find the domain and the range. Trying to draw the domain out. Uh, 
I can put a ruler on my thing. Yeah, I don't find that ruler terribly effective though. I usually use the shape to whatever. Ink to shape. All right, so here's my axes. How, <coughs> so any questions on how I described it? Oh, my set builder notation was destroyed. All right, what type of graph will this domain have? So I wrote it down, basically talking about what points I'm excluding. So I can't have my x is zero. So that's basically that uh, y axis is gone. I can't have x equals zero, so the x axis is gone. Well, I can't have y equals zero, so that's why my x axis is gone. It's always the opposite. Okay. When y is zero, you're on the x axis. When x is zero, you're on the y axis. Okay. So both my axes are out, and of course the origin is out because it's on both the axes. So maybe I'll shade in. So I was using the blue marker. I'll just shade in the four quadrants. So basically where it's not blue. Yep. That's probably the best way to draw it. So it's everything that's not a axis. Is plural of axes? I don't know. I need an English professor. I E S. I don't know. I before E, except when it's not. That's the rule, right? Yeah. I mean, they rhyme a couple things, but I'm pretty sure it's not an exhaustive list. All right. So that's the domain. What about the range? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so why is zero the only number we can't get? Well, that really has nothing to do with can't divide by zero. Well, it is because that's our rule. <laughs> that's the rule, but that's not the reason we can't get zero out of this. That's the reason we cannot input uh, x or y being zero because we can't divide by zero. That's, that's the entire reason behind our domain, having uh, lots of points missing. Because well, you always have a number greater than zero divided by a number greater than zero. So yeah, the only way to get a fraction equal to zero is the numerator. The numerator. Well, we can hit it with a limit and let x and y get really big, but that's not the same as having this equal zero. So. We cannot make this equal zero because x and or y, that product would basically have to be infinity. So any number you put in there is not going to give you infinity. So that's the only number we can't reach. Any other number, even tiny numbers close to zero, you just put a really big x in, really big y, and you'll get a tiny number back out. And real quick, the reason why they had x and y could equal zero is then it would be undefined, right? Correct. So that was, that was part of our domain. Yeah. So it's super important, but that's important for the domain. The reason this can never equal zero is because our numerator is what makes a fraction zero. So that's why we had to remove zero. You could graph the range. Um, if you graph the range, it's going to be on a number line. You're just going to remove zero right at the middle. So I don't think that's terribly instructive to graph the range at this point. So I'm just going to write the range in interval notation. So now we're going to have three dimensions on the input. The output will make a little bit more complicated. So it's a little bit like the previous problem. What dimension is our domain? So we have three dimensional domain. 
So if I'm going to try to graph the domain, I'm really going to have to graph a three-dimensional space. Way easier said than done, so I may avoid actually graphing our domain this time. So we'll describe it a little bit more carefully. So let's find the domain first. The range is actually very easy, given the problem we just looked at. So what's the range on this function? Yep, everything but zero. So that's the only number we can't get out of here. So the range is exactly the same as the last problem. I'll just write that down first. What does the z into the equation? What's that? What does the z value into the equation? What's just the third coordinate, the third input? It does nothing to the range. Oh, because the range is always two dimensional. So how many dimensions is the output of this function? It's one. So x, y, and z are numbers, but when I put numbers in there, I'm going to get a single number back out. Uh, yeah. Whereas the input, basically, if things are separated by commas, they're multidimensional. So if this was a two-dimensional uh, output, what I would see is something, there would be a, some other g of x, y, z right there. I would see one component function and another component function. I guess another way that you could say that is one dimension is because you only do one line and then go to the infinity, uh, put a little circle at zero, saying that it's not included and then keep going all the way to the end. You know what I mean? No, I don't. Uh, is this a number one? Yeah, I yeah. uh, Because all the, oh man, all the, uh, numbers x, y, and z, they're all real numbers. It'd be different if z was a vector, if z itself was, well, I better not be divided by a vector if z is a vector, but all the x, y, and z's are real numbers. So what you're looking at is a combination of real numbers, which is a real number. So if something on the right side was a vector, that'd be a different story. But everything on the right side is a number. So the product quotient, all that stuff, sums, powers, products, quotients are all real numbers. sure what what you're saying it, it's it's a one-dimensional output not because I can put it on a number line because well, I'm looking at yeah, the definition no, I, I, of the function <laughs> <laughs> the consequence of it being one-dimensional is that it exists on a number line yeah I got that part. <laughs> all right so you, with the domain if you remember way back to pre-calculus one class, you can either pick the bad x values, or in this case, the bad x, y, z values, or, or you could pick and then exclude them at the end, or you can pick the good ones, which what I've written down are basically the good ones. I think this will be easier if I pick the bad ones, and then at the end, I'll write all of the points except these special ones. So what I'm going to do is pick the bad ones intentionally, because that gives me a nice so equality. Quick question. So I know we're gonna like do more work to explain it more, but like would you be able to leave that to just stand to write that? Um so yeah, in set builder notation I could basically say all X, Y, Z with this property. That would be correct in set builder notation. But I want a little more descriptive uh version of the domain, aside from just these points with these properties. Uh, we can already see that there's going to be some type of, it looks like a circle forming. So how does that uh, come into play? So x squared plus y squared cannot equal zero, and z cannot equal zero. And yeah, so we're going to look for bad inputs. So what property lets me write down x squared plus y squared is zero, or 
z is 0. What property did I use? So that's our zero product property. So you got a product equals zero, that means one or both of them are zero. So this is zero product property. All right, so how can x squared plus y squared equal zero? What's Remember, x and y have to be real. They can't be complex. So that means individually, they'll never be negative. Those two terms will never be negative. So the only time you could think of this also, if you want to do uh, some geometry for a minute, you could say it's the magnitude of that particular vector. And when is the magnitude equal to 0 of a vector? When you have a 0 vector. So we saw that a couple weeks ago. So you can think about it in vector form if you want. Or you can just look here and say uh, x, x and y would both have to be equal to 0. So that takes care of the first product, or the first factor being 0. So we can't have x and y both 0. Couldn't you have x and y both equal to 0? Uh, if they were complex, then you'd have to worry about things. Uh, there, there'd be a lot more to worry about because you could square them and get negatives. All right, z equals zero. There's not much to do there. Let's think about this in um, in a graph now. Remember, this is what we're excluding. So what we're going to graph is all the stuff we're not going to be using. So you can have the x-axis, the z-axis, or the y-axis. Or even have the y-axis. All right, so let's do, we'll do the one we discovered first. So x and y are both 0. That's bad. What does that describe when x and y are 0? So that'll be all points 0, 0, z. Is that right? 0, 0, z can be anything. All right, so what does that describe on the graph? So that is the z-axis itself right there. So I'll go... Let's use the red and we'll just eliminate the z axis now. So the z axis is out. How do we know that's a plane? So planes look like ax squared plus by, or ax plus by plus cz equals b. We can get the normal. a, b, c is our normal right there. So this is a plane because it fits in that form right there. The normal is 0, 0, 1. So we're looking at a plane, and the normal is pointing straight up. That's probably more analysis than we needed to figure out what plane this was. So I think the correct answer was said is the horizontal the xy plane when your altitude or height is zero. So I'm going to do my best to oops, switch back to red. And I'm going to label this as the xy plane. So we're eliminating the entire ground plus the x-axis. So what's left is basically two donuts. Two infinitely large, infinite rectangular donuts with holes in the middle. So we took, cut everything right at ground level, and then there's infinite uh, axis going straight up that we're also not using. So that's geometrically what we're looking at. And we can go back and write the domain in set builder notation now. So this one is uh, XYZ. Such that, and I'll basically write down, I could write down the original uh, equality. Well, now I want to make sure these are not zero. So I'm going to write down that's a good 
good way to write this. So I want to exclude the xy plane. So I think we'll have to do some parenthesizing here. Either x and y are not zero, or uh, z. So it could be or. So x not zero and y not zero means we are. Means we're not on the z axis. So you're not on the z-axis, or you're not on the xy plane. So I think that's or z not zero. Oh, logic. So that's one way to write it there. I don't want to go into De Morgan's law and all that stuff, but I'll write it down. So go look on Wikipedia if you haven't seen it. It's how to uh, how to invert ands and ors, basically. Or negate them, however you want to look at it. So, rather the graph that you're having red is the graph over here or z? Uh, the gra well, there's two things graphed in red. One of them is z equals zero, that's the plane. And the other one is the z axis, which is really x and y equaling zero. They just go around the z axis because x and y are both zero. Yeah, so when x and y are both zero, you're on the z, the z axis, and we're not allowed to have x and y both zero because we'd be divided by zero. So we have to avoid everything in red. And if you want, you can shade in the plane. This is really the, not just the edge of the plane, the entire plane. All right, so that was domain and range. Now we're going to look at uh, subsets of two-dimensional space. So we're going to call subsets of two-dimensional space regions. So two-dimensional space uh, subsets are going to basically look like blobs. And there could be lots of blobs union together. So before, when you're in one-dimensional space, there were intervals, generally. So they were just bunches of real, uh, numbers. And usually they came in intervals. They were grouped together. So now, intervals, the analog of interval is basically a blob. So it'll turn into, it won't always turn into a nice circle or rectangle, but it will be something similar to that shape. And I say blob because it may have some weird shape that is not just a nice rectangle or circle. So that's what regions are. So now we'll have some definitions. So I'm going to take, <coughs> what this math sentence says is I'm going to take an element x from the set S, and the set S is a subset of R2. So I'll write that out in English. x is an element of S, and S is a subset of R2. So there's really two things going on in this, what I just wrote down. They are X is in S, and S is a subset of R2. So if you wrote it out in full, you're really making two claims. 
you're talking about the relation between x and s and the relation between s and r2. Just like if you have two inequalities in one, you're really having, uh, you're really describing two inequalities total. So <coughs> there's two types of elements of a set. You can have an interior point or a boundary point. And they're basically exactly what you are thinking they are. I'm just going to write out the official definitions of the two types of points. first type is interior. I'll draw a nice picture. So we'll have some blobby set. So how do you think, what would be a good description of interior point in English? Not on the perimeter. <laughs> Not on the perimeter, I like it. So we have to have some way of defining what does it mean to be not on the boundary or not on the perimeter. So I can draw a point not on the perimeter. But what makes that point different than that point? We can say not on the interior, but we so there is so we are going to have uh, some idea of of the space around the point. So if I think about two different points, one is intentionally on the boundary, and the other is intentionally not on the boundary. What I'm going to do is draw what we call a neighborhood around each point. So these are neighborhoods. In two-dimensional space, you could draw neighborhoods as balls or circles, however you like think about it. Uh, when we go to three dimensions, the reason I don't like to use the word circle because you're going to be drawing a sphere in three dimensions. So these are going to be neighborhoods, and they're going to be whatever dimension you're in. So two dimensions is circles, three dimensions is spheres, Four dimensions is four-dimensional sphere. Would the radius of those circles or spheres be infinitely close to the point? They'd be small. So we're about to look and see exactly. I drew them like they're the same size, but obviously if I drew in the interior point, if I drew a larger neighborhood, part of this neighborhood goes outside. So I, and I don't want to say just because I have a neighborhood that is uh, has some exterior points, that doesn't make this point right here a boundary point. So we're going to really carefully define what does it mean to be each of these types. My computer's running really slow today. All right, so let's get on with the definition. So we're going to need to describe these. We'll call them, I think your book calls them disks. So we use letter D for disk. Epsilon is going to be the radius, and we're going to center it at a point X. I am now using the letter X to denote a point in two dimensions, or three dimensions. So X really has two coordinates, or three coordinates, or however many coordinates of the space that you're in. So it doesn't just mean a single um, that we're in one dimensional space. So d epsilon of x is the eps is the open circle of radius epsilon surrounding x. It's the open filled circle. So this is time for set notation. So we'll go y is any point in Rn such that x minus y magnitude less than epsilon. And what I just wrote down our center is x, epsilon is the radius of 
and y is any point on the inside of this. So if you think about x, uh, x minus y magnitude, that's the magnitude of that little line segment I drew. So you're inside the disk whenever the magnitude of that line segment is less than epsilon. If it equals epsilon, you would be on the boundary. And I'm, we're defining these uh, disks to be open, meaning there are no points on the boundary. So it's all points uh, less than epsilon, not less than or equal to epsilon. So any question on disks before we start using them in a complicated definition? So they're just epsilon neighborhoods. And where's the last time you've seen epsilon, or one of the last times you saw epsilon? Yep. So we were using epsilon to talk about the distance uh, we were away on the y-axis. So that's really similar to how we're using them right here. The only difference is, this is a two-dimensional or three-dimensional distance. All right, so our interior point X in S is interior if there exists D epsilon of X such that, and of course your epsilon needs to be greater than zero. You cannot have a zero radius uh, empty neighborhood. So you cannot have a zero or negative radius. There should be a backwards E, but it didn't erase properly. There we go. That backwards E means uh, there exists. If there exists such that and D epsilon X is contained in S. I was concerned there for a minute. We already use Greek. I don't want to use Chinese. Oh, why not? They have left characters, right? Yeah, that's oh, no problem. problem. We will run out. <laughs> <laughs> Could be in 48 dimensional space and not have a problem. They <laughs> 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 have like uh, 4,000 different characters. All right, so this, that's the definition of interior. Let's think about this point again. I think we all agree it looks interior. It doesn't look like a battery point. And what I drew is one neighborhood that is inside of the set S. I could draw another neighborhood very easily that's too big. That is no longer con entirely contained in S. However, the definition said I only need one neighborhood that's inside of S. So therefore what you do is you basically pick a really small epsilon. The best way to do it, just look at your distance, your minimum distance to the boundary and just take half of that and there's your amount right there. So it's important to remember it's just you only need one neighborhood that's inside, one tiny neighborhood inside your set. Now we're going to look at boundary points. and that's the boundary point if so let's think about this carefully <coughs> no matter how small the radius gets what can you say about the neighborhood <coughs> well, th well the neighborhood's always centered at the dot so I can make different size neighborhoods and the neighborhood always contains the perimeter. So it'll have some perimeter points, but what about over here? Those red dots, those are points in the neighborhood, not in the set S. Uh, so basically, or no, yeah, so the neighborhood will contain points that are not in S. And not just the one that I drew, no matter how small I make the uh, radius, I'm going to have points that are not in S inside this neighborhood. So 
this says for all neighborhoods, no matter how small your radius, for all neighborhoods, there needs to be exterior points, points in, in the neighborhood that are not inside S. So that's the definition for boundary. So if all, that's the upside down A, if all D epsilon of X Let's write the word contains contains some point. There's usually more than one point. Some points not in S. Uh, if you want to write that out in a map without using much English. That's how you do it. Where's the end? Intersect. Okay. So this says the neighborhood intersect. That little C means not S. So what is not in S is called the complement. It's spelled with an E, not an I. It's not the compliment you receive when you look nice. It's a compliment meaning what you are not. Or your opposite. Alright. By most people, yeah. It's really similar. You, re you have to know by context. It's like dessert. You know, if you're thirsty or if you're about to eat something delicious. <sighs> compliment. And what in the world is that on the right side? So that's the symbol for nothing or the empty set. So what this says is the neighborhood intersect not S is not nothing. Meaning it's something. <laughs> so it's one of those, I don't know a way to write it without a double negative in math. It's not the empty set, meaning that there is something inside of that. So the complement of S contains some point inside every single neighborhood. That's what it takes to be a boundary point. So now we know interior boundary points. So we can do one more definition. Set S is bounded if any two points, X and Y in S, the magnitude of X minus Y is less than N for some finite N, so for some N in the real numbers. Of course, N is not going to be negative. And it's usually going to be a large number. So what that says is any two points are a finite distance apart, meaning it doesn't go on forever. So if I know that <coughs> uh, the maximum distance two points are separated is n, you could then say that's basically the diameter of your blob. So you could have some weird blobby shape. The diameter will be the whatever two points are the furthest apart. You measure that distance right there. That's basically your diameter of your set. What's the Number, pound sign. The radius of our set is half that? Pound sign, hashtag, I think they call it now. <laughs> I'm from last millennium. <laughs> I have the mind of someone from last millennium. <laughs> well, I was thinking like LB, like pound, but I think it was like LB. So, yeah. That was a straight line between those two points, except if those two points went on to infinity, however, there was still that dip in the middle would be considered unbounded. So if there's any. So that dip, like, 
this set can have a whole lot more stuff. It will be a whole lot more filled out and not be any, and still have the same diameter. So like you could put a whole lot more stuff in this set and kind of fill it out to be more circular without increasing the diameter. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. Uh, so a non-bounded set, what it has are some points that kind of go off forever. So it'll have some sequence of points, or it could be a huge, it could just be single points that just go on forever. So if these go on forever, well, take the original point I have here, and then they get infinitely far away as I go up. So that would be an example of a non-bounded set. Uh, now, even though the set would not be bounded, if it does get infinitely thin, you could actually have a set that has a finite area, but not, but an infinite, uh, but it's unbounded. Just like you can have a curve. Well, we haven't done, we haven't looked at it. You can have a space, space filling curve. You can get we very weird things like a space filling curve and other crazy things like that. Since we have a diameter of our